Sing for Science is made possible in part by support from Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. Today's episode was recorded live at the New Museum in New York City on June 22, 2023, as part of New Inc.'s Demo Days Festival. Don't forget to check out our other episodes and please subscribe to the show. I think of Earth Eater as like something that would like be able to consume something massive, but then become something else afterwards as like a recursive process, which I think is something that is really common in biology also. What's another instance of a recursive process? Mitosis, cell division. So it's like you have a cell, it makes two, and then each one again makes two. So that would be an example of a, of a recursive process. <laughs> Welcome to Sing for Science, the show where musicians and scientists talk about music and science. I'm your host, Matt White. Each week, we'll talk about a song by our guest artist and how it connects with our guest scientist's area of expertise. Today, we'll be speaking with multidisciplinary artist and musician, Earth Eater. Many of Earth Eater's songs draw on inspiration from the darker side of nature, and one of her most recent tracks is entitled Mitosis, which is the biological process of cell division. Also joining us is computational biologist, Dr. Elizabeth Hanaf. Dr. Hanaf heads the Laboratory for Living Interfaces at NYU's Tandon School of Engineering, where she studies the symbiotic relationship between organisms and their environment through scientific and design inquiries. The title of this week's episode on the podcast is Mitosis, Destruction, Genesis, and Porousness in Cell Biology. Hello, Earth Eater and Elizabeth. Thanks for coming on the show. Hello. Hey. It's good to be here. While it is fresh in our mind's eye, could you please tell us a little bit about making that video and the inspiration for it? Well, it was just um, shot in about four minutes after three hours of shooting a still. So just to describe what we were seeing, it was... um, me covered with these prosthetic snails and one of which which was my favorite is this snail that is splitting into two it has two heads but it's sharing the same shell Um, are two-headed snails a thing i don't think so okay um (laughs) well that first thing you answered one of my questions about the snail i mean i didn't know if there was like a, a wrangler or something that had to deal with the snails but they were fabricated they were fabricated okay. by my friend Samantha, yes. And um, Okay. And Elizabeth, from a cell biologist perspective, what is unique about snails? Um, snails are interesting because they can regenerate certain parts of their body. And so we like can't regenerate a limb if we get a limb. And is that off. using mitosis or meiosis? Mitosis. So it's using mitosis. Mitosis, yeah. right? Yeah, that, okay. yeah. So they can regenerate a limb like a lizard. Like some lizards, yeah, some. or starfish. And some snails are androgynous? Snails are actually androgynous, and they can switch between one gender or another, depending oh. on their like needs or feelings at the time. That ties into my whole, the lyrics and what the song is about in a way that I didn't even know. I love that. I love it when that happens. I'm super curious to hear more about your process in, with this particular song, and what made you think about mitosis? Well, I actually, on the way here in the cab, I just wrote it out, because I just to be more concise, so I'm not humming and hawing. Um, I want to point out that kind of lyric of the century for me is, fuck all my senses, I need some perspective. Oh, <laughs> also about that. Um, so the lyrics that are up there online, a fan wrote out. And I actually love leaving what the fans think I'm saying sometimes, just because... It's just cool. It's just, but I, that's not actually what I'm saying. I'm saying fuck on the side to keep some perspective. Really? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Your song is evolving. That's a um, different meaning. <laughs> yeah. A bit. Just a bit of a different meaning. So that's a cute little treat for anyone listening to this podcast. Is you get the re- know the real lyrics. But I did like that when I read that. I did like that whoever 
heard this not most people think I am, so you know that's fine. But um, this is what I wrote. So when I wrote the song, I found myself in a very safe and deep, loving, romantic relationship that ambiently formed over time without the usual conversations, rules, and restraints I'd experienced in the past. This relationship provided an environment where I could grow. Mitosis is essentially growth, right? Yeah. So I suppose I see the first cell as the potential relationship, which then splits into me and this other person, and we split and grow ourselves and turn into the body of the relationship that we both live in together in harmony. I chose mitosis over meiosis because the daughter cells are identical, which is important because I'm trying to illustrate the balance and eye to eye evenness of mutual respect. What feels natural and honest is what feels best, and yet we do often lash against that truth. I speak about the angel and knowing one's demons and embracing them to have better clarity and awareness. I use these spiritual symbols and mention the fallen angel to shout out nature. Someone said once that nature is Satan's temple. I don't believe in Satan, but I believe in nature. It's pretty indisputable. Nature's inclination is pointed towards growth and advancement, ultimately, and this song is about the kind of relationship that doesn't inhibit or contradict that. That's a wonderful explanation. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it feels like very vulnerable also, and um, I think something that's interesting to me in the idea of mitosis is that it's both a generative and a destructive process in a oh, certain way. Oh, okay, yeah. Because that relationship is no longer more. <laughs> <laughs> generative in the sense that it's generating a new entity, like a new cell, but it's also destructive in the sense that the body of the mother cell does need to like tear itself apart to be able to generate that next cell and that next generation, which I think is maybe something that you just touched upon also, this kind of balance between generative and destructive. Right, the, you're illuminating the fact that the mother cell essentially disappears. Yes. And it's like moving forward and yeah, so it's like also just driving home the idea of change and things changing. Could you give us a, kind of a, a primer on mitosis, what it is? So mitosis is a process of cell division where one cell will generate two identical cells. So identical to each other, but also identical to that original cell. As you note, which is different from meiosis, where a cell divides and generates two cells that are identical to each other, but not identical to the original one. And so each cell in all of our bodies, but any other kind of multicellular organism that we can imagine, contains all of the DNA necessary to program every single cell in the body. So like your skin cells only use part of that DNA, but the skin cells also have all of the DNA that say a liver cell would be using or an eyeball cell or something like that. So to be able to generate all these cells that contain all of the, the same identical information, it's important before a cell divides to be able to make a copy of that information so that then each daughter cell can receive one of those identical copies. So that's like the generative part in a certain sense because the cell itself is like preparing itself in a really like deep and committed way for that division by spending a bunch of energy on copying all of the genetic information of that particular individual to then be able to redistribute that information between the two daughter cells. In that preparation, when we spoke last week, you made mention that it involves a, a very clear choice, I think was the phrase that you used. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a commitment, right? So this cell is making a decision that is a complete commitment and that you can't go back on. So a cell can't like divide and be like, whoops, sorry. Like, actually, can we, <laughs> can we just merge back together? Mm. And so, so it's a really big decision for a cell, and it requires kind of going through a bunch of like cellular, intracellular checks to make sure that the cell is ready for that. Mm -hmm. Are there any situations where there are variants like where it does slightly change or is it mitosis is always exactly, it always maintains its exact? There's a bunch of situations in which it's not the same. So there's random mutations that can happen. 
there's... Is that ever a positive thing or is it usually someone's sick or it's not... What time yeah. scale are we talking on? Um, <laughs> the question. human life to or tell evolution? Me the <laughs> oh, right. Well, evolution, that's a positive thing, yeah. right? Or yeah. So those changes, like over a long period of time, those changes can lead to like innovation. And they're minute and they're... Yeah, minute, progressive. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, nothing happens or something bad happens. But then sometimes there's some kind of great innovation that happens, which leads to like some kind of adaptation. Like when humans started eating mushrooms and invented fire. There you go. <laughs> that's called the stoned ape hypothesis. <laughs> oh, that's Terrence McKenna's. Yes. Yeah, like that one. And everybody refer to the Sync for Science episode with Paul Stamets and Modest Mouse because they talk oh about that. Oh my God, yeah. Oh, Paul Stamets and Modest Mouse. <laughs> I'm going to listen to that one. That one's for you. All right, That's great. A winning That's really exciting. So, is that choice, is that moment programmed in its DNA, a cell's DNA? I mean, it's a decisive moment, and different cells will make different kinds of decisions with respect to that. So, say a cell in, say, a skin cell, it, you get a cut, and then the cells around the cut are going to all of a sudden decide to divide really rapidly mm. and fill that back in and like grow new tissue. Or maybe a stem cell, like those in our bone marrow, are going to divide extremely slowly and so make the decision most of the time to to not divide. And that's called quiescence, which I think is an interesting kind of poetic term. It's like a state of like active waiting in a certain sense for the right right moment to do something. Um, Quiescence. 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 Good one. Did you tell me snails are 100%... Top to bottom stem cells? No, so they can regrow some of their organs, but not all of them. So okay. we can regrow none of our organs. Okay. So they're already like winning on us in that perspective. They can regrow some of them, but not all of them. Can we, how, how can we fix that using snails? Though? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, there's really good face masks with snail trails. Snail trails. <laughs> Wait, what? Um, well, there's even snail facials where they put snails all over your face. To, it's really good for your skin. Oh, I'm just thinking about um, in Italy, I saw someone getting a pedicure with a bunch of fish in the foot bath. I'm sure that didn't smell very good. No. <laughs> so I would like to know a little bit about your practice because I know, I don't know if it was this song, but some of your music has been composed during artist residencies, right? Yes. This one too? This one was composed during a viral residency. <laughs> this virus hit the world and we were all locked in our rooms for two years. Um, yeah, no, I wrote this during COVID. Okay, so you happen to be in an exotic locale? Uh, not with this song, no. Okay, I'm curious to know, like, how do you end up in artist residencies working on music? Do you require that level of immersion or seclusion? Solitude, or? being able to have time alone is very helpful in my creative process, yeah, for sure. But this song... It just kind of expedites the process. Also. Sure. Where I'm getting the artist's residency information was I think the one podcast I've heard you on, you were... Were you in the Cayman Islands? <gasps> oh, yes, I was in the Cayman Islands. Yeah, I, um, a song on my new album was written there. It's, it's, a, it's a huge blessing. People just reach out to me and say, come here and live in these amazing places for a few months, and I, I do it. And then are you tasked with anything specific, like based on the residency? If I am, I just do Disregard what I it. want. Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes, but yeah. I did some of it. Mm. But yeah, I made a lot of my new album. Okay. But not really. Usually I think I write a proposal for what I want to do. And okay. they decide, they always say that it's, yeah. And this new album comes out next month, right? Um, the first single does, which actually... I know it's not about this song, but since you talked about the minute changes that are, can happen in mitosis and how that essentially is what is required for evolution, I, I want to talk about my next single called Pure Smile Snake Venom. And it's about the origin of the smile and the first smile, what a smile came from. And it's when we diverged from our reptilian instincts of just attacking without any process and sort of thought before that, and which when we merge into being mammals. 
and the first smile ultimately being a threat where you're baring your fangs saying I could rip you to shreds but I choose not to because I like you or I want to I don't want to kill you mm. <laughs> um, and um, that being that eventually turning into what is the smile which is What's the song title again? Pure Smile Snake Venom. That's great. Yeah, Bearing of the Fangs. But yeah, that's about evolution. And yeah, in, in the video, I'm, I'm going to um, try to make a time lapse of evolution in my own way, which is going to be really interesting. Have you ever worked with snakes? Nope, mm -hmm. I have not. Have you worked with snails, though? I haven't worked with snails either. What kind of animals do you work with? I've worked with plants okay. and microbes also. And humans also. I did cancer research for a while. Oh, okay. Wait, that. so what's... Is that mitosis, cancer cells? Well, it's like a... I guess like a dysregulation of the mitosis okay. process in which a cell that shouldn't be dividing is dividing way too much. Yeah. And so, like, there's always this kind of dynamic maintenance of, like, stasis, mm. which is not, like, immobility, but more like a dynamic process. And then for many possible different reasons, that stasis can get unbalanced. And then you have a lot more mitosis and a lot more cell division than you anticipate. And, and that is what makes a tumor. So can you tell us a little bit about specifically what it is you do with your research, microbes, humans, cities? Sure, <laughs> yeah. So I run a research lab at NYU, and we're interested in environmental microbiomes, so like populations of microorganisms in the, in the environment, and how they kind of mediate these porous boundaries between humans and environment. Because one thing that's kind of emerging in the science literature at the moment is that human health and well-being is really tightly related to our relationship with our microbiome, like the gut microbiome being really important, skin microbiome. Um, but the human microbiome like interacts with and is impacted by the environmental microbiome, so the environment of the like spaces that we work in and live in and transit through. Um, and so... And the environmental microbiome is then kind of sculpted by design decisions by de design practitioners. So like architects, city planners, you know, somebody, a human being made all the decisions that led to this space that we're inhabiting for this afternoon. And a lot of those decisions are going to impact what kind, what the like microbial signature of this environment is going to be. So if you could link it all together, ultimately you could like design probiotic cities, right? Like if you knew what kind of environmental microbiome would be best for human health and well-being and like how our design decisions impacted that, then you would be able to like design a probiotic building or a probiotic city. How would you do that? Well, <laughs> it's kind of tricky because as far as like thinking about beneficial relationships with microbes, we're really good at thinking about like contentious relationships with microbes, like identifying specific players as pathogens and deciding how we want to eliminate them. So we know how to give a name to what's bad for us, but we don't really know how to give a name to right. what's good for us. Doctors say I don't get sick because of all the horse shit I was around as a child. <laughs> <laughs> Things are too clean. Things are way too clean. Yeah. You didn't get sick because of I all the. I don't get sick because of all the horse shit. Yeah. Huh. You grew up on a horse farm. Yes. Where? Uh, in Pennsylvania. Were you actually were you raising horses and shoveling the yes. stables and stuff? I shoveled a lot of horse shit. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Metaphorically, actually. Both. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you. I actually work at a horse barn here in New York City. Do you? Yeah. Where? <laughs> we should talk horses. Is it Jamaica day. Bay? It's not Jamaica Bay. Oh, it's that's in where I ride. It's the Gallup NYC like therapeutic horsemanship barns. I've been to quite a few, but um, it's crazy to think there's horses in New York City. Thank God. <laughs> I, when I when in doubt, I just go to Jamaica Bay. And they have a track. It's mostly ch show jumping. Okay. But yeah, I go and train there. Yeah. There's a really great thoroughbred called Malcolm. Have you seen Nope yet? No, what is that? It's the uh, new Jordan Peele horror movie about um, oh. Hollywood horses. Oh, damn. No. I, <laughs> I shouldn't have brought it up, but it's, it's a good movie. <laughs> But say having horse barns in the city, I think, is actually a really good biodiversity intervention. Because we don't really know what kind of environmental microbiome is going to be best for humans. And maybe we shouldn't actually be designing only for humans, but for all of the other types of organisms. 
non-human organisms, but like a, a good gut microbiome is going to be different for me as it's going to be different from you and it's going to be different for you. Um, so we can't really like be prescriptive about like what kind of organisms we need in our environment for that to be beneficial. Like I don't imagine us being able to like make a spray or something that you could spray your house with. But in general, the metric that's emerging is like more diversity is always better. And so having other types of species like horses or green spaces, for and example. And not sterilizing everything. And not sterilizing everything, yeah. Have you seen the effects of having used hand sanitizer yet, like on a cellular level? For, I mean, everyone using it. Insane. You know, I think that in 20 years or so, we're probably going to see an uptick, or maybe less than that, 15 years, we're going to see an uptick in people with like autoimmune conditions, mm -hmm. especially, I think, sadly, for infants who were born during covid because in infants, it's really important to establish a diverse microbiome within the first three months of life. Mm. And so a lot of the infants who have been born during this time of isolation won't have been exposed to that diverse microbiome. So my prediction is that like 15 years from now, we'll see that because that's one of the known consequences of not being exposed to diverse microbial populations early in life. So when those children are 15, they would manifest. Right. Okay. You said something in an interview that I found fascinating. That's that when we consider how we influence the environment and vice versa, that it broadens the notion of identity. Yeah, I mean, we like to think of our like body as a temple, as like something that's isolated from the environment. Satan's temple. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, no, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> but but we're not really isolated from our uh, from our environment, and it's and it's what's shaking out is that a lot of like physical characteristics or like phenotypes of macroscopic multicellular organisms, like ourselves and plants and animals. What are phenotypes? Phenotype is a physical characteristic. Okay. So something like hair color, eye color, height, um, are due not only to our own genotype or like the genes that we have inherited from our parents, but also to our interactions with the microorganisms that we live in symbiosis with. So if you think of like identity as being genetic identity, which is like debatable also, mm -hmm. but if like working under that assumption, then that means that we need to broaden our notion of identity to include not only our own genes, but also the genes of the microorganisms that we live in symbiosis with. And How many microorganisms should exist in us? Trillions. Mm -hmm. There's actually almost just as many microbial cells in your body as you have human cells, but because they're so much smaller, we don't look like blobs of microbes. Nice. <laughs> But I think it's something kind of hopeful in the sense because it makes it that there's aspects of our uh, of our identity that are actually mutable within the within our lifetime, um, which is not something that is the case with respect to our like the human genes that we have inherited. Those are immutable except for like the little changes, like mutations that are happening in the case of mitosis. But I think it's interesting because it kind of it provides this like continuum with between ourselves and the environment some kind of like porous boundaries that allows us to be like impacted in very meaningful ways by the environments that we inhabit mm -hmm. yeah i i've struggled and continue to struggle with um depression and i remember reading that there was a neural network in our stomachs and a lot of mood imbalance is due to our our flora being messed up. And um, I, I definitely do feel better when I'm making sure to be eating a lot of probiotics and drinking kombucha and eating kimchi and also taking supplements. It just makes me feel better overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was a really amazing discovery. Yeah, the gut-brain axis. Mm -hmm. It's a humbling experience, I think, because like we as humans, we consider ourselves to be very cerebral, you know, like philosophers will like to say that, you know, what matters in our thinking is just our brain and that we can abstract ourselves from our bodies. But not at all. <laughs> What's the latest research on the, the gut brain? Um, so the general the general idea, really, and then there's a lot of specifics within that, is that it's actually microorganisms within your gut that will signal and trigger the synthesis of neurotransmitters in your brain. So in particular, serotonin, which is a really important neurotransmitter for you know mental health and brain functioning in general and mood. 
whether that neurotransmitter is, um, it's not made by the microbes in your gut, but it's the microbes in your gut that will actually signal to your brain when is it that you should make more of it. Mm. Okay. I thought serotonin was actually secreted in the GI tract, but it's... It's a signal- trigger. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. That's very interesting. Super interesting. <laughs> the... the um, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about your art practice, too. I mean, not just because we are in an art museum. I mean, I, like, I guess I like to make art about the things that I do in the lab, but the scientific method is pretty pretty formulaic, you know? Like, we write these manuscripts and stuff, and then I start to, like, wax poetic in the conclusions about, like, feminist theory and multi-species entanglements, and then the reviewers are like, nope. <laughs> oh. Wait, what is that process, the reviewers... And this is, are you talking about like science journals? Or like something? peer-reviewed articles, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you like do all your experiments and then you write up your paper that describes your experiments and the conclusions that you've derived from them. And then in the like conclusion, that's where you kind of talk about like big picture implications. Mm. Um, but reviewers really like for you to talk about the big picture implications of say like the engineering applications of what you're doing and not necessarily talking about like how do I ask consent of the microbes that I'm growing in my lab as to whether they want to participate in my experiment or not? Mm. Well, <laughs> so I mean, the art practice is that's what that is for. <laughs> I want to say one more thing though about the peer review process because or or science criticism about which I know close to nothing, but I'm just going to go and say it anyway. Like it's kind of bullshit, right? <laughs> Actually, Suzanne Samard, this concept of the mycorrhizal network, which is sort of accepted as gospel, right? I think initially I heard her say that other scientists referred to her work as a dog's breakfast, you know? Like, just wrote it off as it was just like some hippie baloney or something like that. So I... Many visionary scientists have encountered the same thing with with peer review, yeah. Okay. Well, isn't that because a lot of the financiers are they're somehow having to be biased or like... It's definitely an industry. There's a chain reaction of Mm. control, yeah. And I mean, I guess the intention is good of having like your community of peers review your work and have that kind of like sense of like validation. But I think the fact that it's been monetized in very specific ways has kind of made it depart from like that theoretical ideal. Is there a platform or a community where your your ideas that are being written off get to exist and be viewed and studied? Well, I think art practice is really good for that. I'll also plug that I'm on the editorial board for a new journal (laughs) called Mm -hmm. Biotechnology and Design that aims to publish things that don't necessarily fit squarely in the science box. But I think that's really what what artists are are really good at, is like Mm -hmm. challenging those particular types of ideas and asking the why questions. Like science lets you answer the how and the what Mm -hmm. questions, but art practice, the humanities philosophy, is what allows you to ask the why questions. Amen. We're not above plugging work here, so let's look at what you've got coming down the pike here. Um, So this is an exhibit that is starting next week. Could you tell us about this? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, So this is a show that's opening at a gallery in Gowanus next week, and it's a collaborative effort, and there's um, other members of of this collaboration. But what we've done here is... I've been studying in the lab the microorganisms that live in the Gowanus Canal. So for those of you who have lived in New York for a while, it's a highly contaminated environment. And from a human perspective, it's a forsaken environment. It's like the most unenvironmental but environment. But there, there are stuff lives in there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're living and thriving. Uh, They're living and thriving, and also these microbes have evolved a lot of really interesting metabolisms that degrade the toxic compounds that they're being challenged with. And so... You know, they're, they're degrading these toxic compounds. If we were to leave them to do their thing, then they would slowly decontaminate this, like, anthropogenic environment. But that's, that's not the case because um, it's a super fun site, and so the Army Corps of Engineers is coming in to remediate, which means dredging, covering everything with concrete, putting the water back, and then selling, you know, million-dollar condos. The whole canal. <laughs> the whole canal. Yeah. Covered with concrete. The sediment at the bottom, which is where the toxicity is most uh, concentrated. Okay. Um, So the the things that kind of emerge about these ideas is like, well, on one hand, 
it's kind of proof that like mother nature, if we choose to gender that idea is, you know, able to, to fix themselves, which mm-hmm. I think is uh, really nice to have data to support that. It's also pretty poetic in the sense that we're able to correlate all of these like living, breathing 2023 metabolisms of the living microbiome with historical records of of industry at that site. And so arguably, I think that the microbially kept records are probably better kept records than mm. human kept records because, you know, human kept records are notoriously flawed. History is written by the victor. Illegal dumping isn't reported. But the microbiome is maintaining this like molecular memory mm. of the history of human intervention. And the, what we're doing with this art project is kind of a pushback against what most of what the kind of obvious outcome of this work would be, which would be to be like, oh, great, these microbes are doing this cool thing. Let's like mine it and exploit these molecular mechanisms that they've developed and figure out some kind of biotech product or solution from Mm. that. So are you working at odds with the exploitative elements? Well, I think it's I think it's important questions to ask. Right. Because like as we're writing up this manuscript, like the title that shakes out of this work is like, bioremediation and biomining potential of the microbiome of a contaminated urban superfund site. And then you're like, wait a minute, this is exactly the extractive mentality that got us into this pickle in the first place, right? Because most of this contamination is from petrochemical industry, which is also itself a resource out of place that somebody found somewhere and was like, oh, great, this cool thing in nature that exists, let me like exploit it and then end up concentrating it elsewhere. Um, So we're trying to kind of challenge that incumbent hierarchy or like power dynamic between humans and microorganisms or maybe even humans and many organisms in which if we find something interesting that's happened in nature, then our impetus is to like exploit it. And so this exhibit is next week. And where is this? It's called the Open Source Gallery and it's in Gowanus. Okay, great. I have maybe a question about process and relationship to environment, because you're saying that you make a lot of your work in in residencies, and you mentioned the like being able to work alone aspect. But is there also aspects of the environment that you feel are interacting with your creative process? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if it's stressful, it's harder. <laughs> um, but maybe I don't know. I guess sometimes difficult environments are a cool challenge and are good for initial spurts of inspiration, but the actual execution is um, having solitude, space, and time helps for sure. So I'll quiescently wait for (laughs) the next (laughs) opportunity. Perfect. That's radio gold you just gave us. (laughs) But no, um, also really nice food and probiotics help I guess microbes making music Mm -hmm. yeah definitely I have one more question what was the inspiration for your name um I just felt like it's sort of all-encompassing and I'm really conceptually claustrophobic and I I feel like it can be interpreted in many different ways like an earth eater is a worm and it's also a galactic entity swallowing planets and it's Mm. also a Haitian pregnant woman eating mud pies or you know it can be a million different things Mm. or it can also be a fish perfect well it's been great thank you so much and thank you to to new ink for having us uh thank you for our friends at science sandbox for supporting the show and most importantly thank you dr elizabeth hanaf and earth eater thank you thank you (laughs) check out earth eater's sixth album powders out November 20th on her label, Chemical X. She will embark on a U.S. and E.U. headline tour this November and December. For more information, go to her website, eartheater.solar. For more information about Elizabeth's research and artwork, please visit her website, elizabeth-hanaf.net. Sing for Science is co-produced by TalkHouse and made possible in part by a grant from Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. Our music is by Panoram, social media manager is Bailey Constis, and digital producer is Keenan Cush. Special thanks to Salome Asega, Raouls Ben Getch, Karen Holmberg, Jeff Bratton, Lana Miller, and Carrie Tolls for their help producing today's show. 
If you liked today's episode, the best way you can support us is to give us a review, tell a friend about the show, and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. For more information, go to singforscience.org and follow us on social media at Sing for Science. Thanks for listening.